Okay, so let's start off with an introduction to this field of chemistry, all right? And um, this would be chapter one, of course. And in this chapter, we'll be, as its title suggests, be introduced to what chemistry is all about. And the definition of this particular discipline is seen on the screen right here. It is the science of the composition, structure, and properties and reactions of matter, especially of atomic and molecular systems. So as suggested by the definition, at the heart of chemistry is matter. And later on, we're gonna learn what matter is. By definition, matter is anything that has mass and volume. Now, in chemistry, we are concerned with the type of uh, matter in terms of its composition. So when we're referring to the composition of matter, we're talking about basically its makeup, the different elements that goes into making up the substance and also the relative proportions of the different elements present in that substance. We're also concerned with the structure. So what we're talking about here when it comes to the structure is how at the microscopic level, the atoms are linked to each other. All right. Um, later on, we're going to learn more about this. We're going to learn about covalent bonds and ionic bonds and how this these types of bonding lead to the growth structure of these different substances. And then we are concerned also with the properties. So when we're talking about the properties of matter, we're talking about those defining characteristics, right? So things like color, things like taste, things like smell, boiling point, melting point, um, densities, and so on. And then finally, we're concerned with the type of chemical changes that these substances will undergo. Right? So all these four different aspects that we're concerned with in chemistry are connected, right? In order for us to understand the structure, we need to understand something about the composition. And also we need to understand the structure in order to understand the type of reactions that they will undergo. And reactions are basically for a particular substance, one of those properties um, that we'll be looking at when it comes to matter. Because later on, we're gonna learn that matter is anything, um, well, properties um, can be put into categories of physical and chemical. All right, now before we move any further into chemistry, I want to take a bit of a detour and talk about the scientific method, which is the method that is used by scientists in order to explain what we observe in nature, all right? So this is not exclusive to chemistry. This is basically used by every well, scientists of every discipline, biology, chemistry, physics, um, astronomy, etc., And there are certain steps involved when it comes to the scientific method. And we're going to go through these steps so you understand how this method works, right? So the first step involved in the scientific method is that we define a problem by recognizing it and stating it clearly. All right, so in science, we call this an observation. And then the next step is that we propose a tentative explanation for the observation. And in the scientific method, we call this the hypothesis, right? So it's very important at this juncture that you understand what the hypothesis is. It's basically a tentative explanation, um, reasonable explanation. You can't just put up any um, explanation or any ideas to um, as, a, as, a, as, a hypo, as a hypothesis. Right? It has to be something that you know kind of makes sense, right? Um, but of course, we're not satisfied with just putting up an explanation um, for the observation. What we have to do now is that we have to decide on the best way to test the hypothesis. Now, how do we do this? Well, it depends. In the natural sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, etc., we do that by performing um, a carefully designed experiment, and in most cases, more than one experiment, and the purpose of this is to basically knock down the hypothesis to see if it's true, right? So the experiment is designed so as to see whether or not the, experiment, the hypothesis is falsifiable, uh, which basically means that we design the experiment for the sole purpose of knocking down the hypothesis if the hypothesis is not true. Um, so basically at this point, we're basically scrutinizing the hypothesis um, to see if it can hold up to any testing. Now, this is where things get a bit interesting um, because after experimentation, 
more than likely, especially during the initial stage, stages, the data that you end up with from the experiment does not fit the original hypothesis. So what this means, therefore, is that you have to make modifications to the hypothesis, or you may have to ditch that hypothesis and come up with a new one, right? So steps three and four, where you do your experimentation, refine your hypothesis, is repeated over and over again until at the end of the repeated processes of experimentation and putting forward new hypothesis, the hypothesis will successfully predict what will happen and it will become what is called a scientific law which is basically a description of what is observed um, consistently. It's a statement for which there are no exceptions um, as it relates to what is observed when you do the repeated um, refinement of the hypothesis through experimentation. Now, this refined hypothesis, right, now becomes what is known as a theory. And it's very important that you understand the difference between a theory and the hypothesis. If you recall, the hypothesis is basically uh, an explanation, a model, that is put forward um, to explain what is observed initially. The theory is basically a refined hypothesis. In other words, it's an explanation or model that is backed by the evidence and data coming from repeated experimentation, all right? And by then, um, the theory usually is accept accepted widely among scientists until somebody comes with other evidence to basically knock down the theory. Okay, so what you're going to see here is a flow chart of the experimental, or I should say the scientific approach. So as I said before, you start off with your observations, right? And then you put forward a hypothesis, tentative hypothesis, to explain initially what was observed in the first step. And then you do your experimentation to test the hypothesis. And as I said before, usually in the initial stages, um, the experimental data will not be in harmony with the original hypothesis, so you have to go back to the hypothesis, refine it, change it, or ditch it, or, and come up with a new hypothesis, and then you perform experimentations on that again. And so this process is continued until the refined hypothesis becomes the theory. And remember, the theory is basically the model which is backed by the weight of the evidence that you have gleaned from your experimental data. Um, as a result of repeat experimentation. And as I said before, even though you might have a theory that is widely accepted by you know, the scientific community, somebody somewhere on this planet might be tinkering in a lab and come up with experimental data that refutes the theory. And therefore, further experimentation is required. So this is what happens in the scientific method. And um, the history of science is full of examples of situations where you have a theory that has been accepted by the scientific community, and then somebody comes out of the blue, um, sometimes even by accident, and came up with experimental data which destroys the well, well, which destroys the accepted theory at the time. All right, so that's basically what the scientific approach is all about, and this is the reason why we have um, scientific development. Um, which basically improve our lives in many ways, all right? Um, it comes down to basically the steps that are followed here. Okay, so I want to um, re-emphasize some things that we said before in terms of definition. And especially, it's very important for you to understand the difference between these three terms, the hypothesis, the theory, and the law, right? Um, the hypothesis, as we said before, is a tentative explanation which serves as a basis for further experimentation, while the theory is basically a well-established hypothesis. In other words, it's a hypothesis that has been developed as a result of repeated experimentation. And you get a lot of data, and the data um, supports this particular model, right? So that's the difference between the theory and the hypothesis. The hypothesis comes before the theory. The hypothesis is a tentative explanation while the theory is a well-established explanation based on data arriving as a result of the repeated testing of the initial hypothesis. Now, those two things are different from the law. The law is basically a statement which um, encapsulates what is observed about a particular system in nature, right? Please note that the law is not an explanation, right? The explanation lies in the theory.
the law just basically states what happens as far as a particular phenomena is concerned. So a good example of this, we're going to see later on in chapter 13, is Boy's Law, right? Boy's Law basically says that the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume. So basically what that means is that as the pressure is doubled, the volume is halved and vice versa, right? For example. Now, that statement, Boy's Law, is not an explanation. It just tells what is observed, right? Every time the pressure increases, the volume decreases. Every time the volume increases, the pressure decreases for a gas, right? So that's it. It doesn't explain why that happens. It just says this is what happens consistently, and there's no known cases of this not happening as far as the relationship between pressure and volume is. Now, the theory, as far as explaining that observation, is known as the kinetic molecular theory, which I will not go into right now, but we're going to learn about it in chapter 13. And basically, that theory explains at the microscopic level, based on the behavior of the molecules of a gas, why is it that when the pressure is reduced for a gas, um, the volume increases, all right? So um, that example basically is highlighting the difference between the theory, which explains what is observed, and the law, which basically a statement of what is observed, all right? Okay, um, so again, just to emphasize or re-emphasize the difference between the hypothesis and theory, we have this chart. Hypothesis is basically an explanation, tentative explanation of certain facts that were observed um, in the first step and therefore provides basis for further experimentation, while the theory is an explanation based on the evidence and facts to support it, all right? Okay, now, believe it or not, in our everyday lives, we actually employ some version of the scientific method when it comes to solving certain problems, all right? So I'm just gonna look at one simple example so that you see how this works, right? Now, let's say you want to play your favorite CD, right? So you want to play your favorite CD and you put it in a particular CD player. And you observe that the CD in the CD player skips, right? Now, that's your observation. That's the very first step in the scientific um, method that, that we described earlier. So the question now becomes, um, how do we solve this problem, right? Because you want to listen to your favorite CD. So that means you'd have to come up with a reasonable explanation as to why the CD um, in the CD player skips. And logically speaking, we can come to two conclusions. Either something is wrong with the CD itself, in other words, the CD is defective, or something is wrong with the CD player, right? So we're going to look at each um, possible explanation. Now, what I've just stated are two possible hypotheses. All right, so let's deal with the first hypothesis, which means that the CD player is faulty, right? So what we have to do next is to test this particular hypothesis and the test that you'd come up with in order to explain why the CD player is, um, well, actually you have to come up with an experimentation um, to test this particular hypothesis. So the experimentation is that you're going to replace a CD with another CD um, using the same player. And what was observed when this is done is that the second CD um, played okay. The sound um, coming from the second CD um, does not skip. So basically the theory is that there's nothing wrong with the CD player that you're using initially. So that means that the only other alternative is the next hypothesis is that the original CD has an effect. So how do we test this hypothesis? Then we take, well, what we'll do is that we perform an experiment where we take um, that CD and put it in another player. And in this particular case, the sound still skips. So therefore, the conclusion that we can come to is that it is the original CD that has a defect. And that would be the working theory as far as solving this problem is concerned. All right? Okay. Um, so that's basically it for chapter one. Um, until next time.